Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is John Mum. I'm a water planner with Interstate Stream Commission. Uh, we'll get this presentation presentation started in a few minutes. We're going to give time for people to get on. I will get this presentation started. Uh, again, my name is John Mum. Uh, I'm a water planner with the Interstate Stream Commission of New Mexico. Today, we are talking about resilience assessment initiation. Uh, this is a, a presentation, more of a discussion than the webinars that we've we've had in the past. So, um, I do ask that if you once you jump on to mute yourselves. Um, if you have issues later on when we do a discussion session um, that um, you let us know in chat that um, you're unable to unmute yourself during the discussion so we can make sure that you can join into that discussion. So um, this is going to be a little more interactive. There's going to be a few polls, a little discussion in the middle and at the end. And so I hope you enjoy this. Uh, today, we're going to focus on the agricultural and livestock watering sector. And I'm going to introduce you to Ralph Schmidt-Peterson, the ISC director. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you, John. Uh, can you move? Well, actually, I'll just start something on this slide real quickly. So um, as many of you are aware, and I believe a lot of you um, have been engaged in looking at the webinars that uh, New Mexico Bureau of geology and mineral resources is put on with the isc partnering with us on the physical science aspects of what new mexico should expect from increasing temperatures over the next 50 years for our water resources and i'll i'll say a little bit of more of that as we as we we dive into this presentation but i i do want uh, people to to be thinking that what we're trying to do with this resilience assessment is really gauge your reactions to that leap ahead information and tie those things together. And we're really looking for your input um, on that document, but also on what we're trying to put together um, with this set of webinars. Uh, need to make you all aware and also recognize the partners that we have in uh, these efforts. And so I already mentioned New Mexico Tech with the Bureau of Geology and Mineral Resources. We could not be doing that without them and without their volunteer researchers who provided you know, so much input um, to that leap ahead assistant, assessment. We also have New Mexico Water Resources Research Institute that we'll be saying a little bit more about later. The New Mexico Water Dialogue we wanna thank. New Mexico Indian the Department of Indian Affairs that is doing a uh, parallel tribal outreach process. And we don't have it on here, but also the US Army Corps of Engineers who is partnering with us um, to kind of pull together the information that we receive from all of you who are the experts in 
addressing variability um, you know, with water and climate on your lands. And so, John, could you go to the next slide? So just to, to kind of focus people on what we're trying to do today and then over the next few weeks. So um, in the presentation today, and we have a pretty long presentation with some breaks, um, you know, we're, we're first going to do a, an overview of the 50-year plan, what we're trying to do. Then we're going to, uh, John is actually going to weigh in and talk about um, what these increasing temperatures um, have done and are likely to do relative to agriculture and some of the current impacts we're aware, aware of. And then we want to stop and have, as John mentioned, that discussion on impacts. We want to um, basically get that recorded either verbally or through chat. So I need to make everybody aware that you know when you're unmuted, this is being recorded and we will we will have that information. We're going to put it up on our website, both as a resource for people to look at, uh, the PowerPoint presentation and the recording. Um, and uh, and hopefully people can also use that for some of the surveys we're going to talk about. Then we're going to dive into this uh, uh, resilience explanation and overview. And today, this is really what we're thinking of uh, putting out as surveys to agriculture, agricultural water users, which we, we know are not one group of people uh, doing things in one way, and, um, and trying to determine, do we, are we asking the right questions? Are we assessing the right things? Are we missing anything? We really want to get your input on that, and we'll do that initially today through this discussion element. Next, John. So, you know, where is all of this heading? And it's really heading to this point, uh, you know, what the 50-year water plan will contain. And um, at, at, its, at its, you know, kind of functional level, it's an executive level reporter plan with supporting materials that goes to the governor's office and our legislators to my ISC commissioners. Um, it provides an overview of the anticipated changes across our landscape and our outreach efforts that we're doing. Um, that's essentially where we've been so far in this process. And then it dives into these next pieces. So, you know, what we really want to assess and we want to help with and get your help on is, you know, uh, uh, having a goal of resilience for our communities, for environment, for our different users in the face of this change. And so the first place we have to start with there is what does that mean for resilience? And then based upon that, get input from all of you to identify where New Mexicans are resilient to the anticipated changes and to identify where more work is needed to improve resilience and adaptation strategies to address that or opportunities. I really want to remark in here too, though, this is not one water user versus another. This is a scan across the state, you know, um, kind of more broadly than that. It's not a ranking or anything. It's really trying to assess where, where, where people in the environment are mainly at risk or most at risk and what can be done to basically reduce that risk. So from that, and we're going to move into a recommendation uh, phase and that probably will be um, you know, early next year on policies, on operations or land management issues, you know, um, thoughts and input for local decision makers about their decision making and then on research that still needs to happen. Uh, there'll be a bunch of supporting materials for this, uh, including the leap ahead assessment, um, a water budget for the state of New Mexico uh, that the Water Resources Research Institute is developing, and then lots of web materials about water budgets, leap ahead and so on, that the ISC is developing with the US Army Corps of Engineers and our other partners. So that's where we're heading. March, April, 2022. Uh, John, next slide. And uh, and this is just uh, another way of getting back to that same place. Where are we at? So we're, uh, we can see the red arrow there. 
We're at the September into November 2021 time period, the resilience assessment. Um, pointing up above, the Bureau of Geology and Mineral Resources has done this leap ahead assessment. I would be remiss if I didn't remind all of you that the comment period for the peer reviewed report from the Bureau of Geology and Mineral Resources is still open. That's on our website. And, um, and we would ask everybody to take a look at that and weigh in on, you know, if there's peer reviewed science in particular that you're aware of that's not incorporated in that report from a physical set science standpoint, please, you know, uh, alert the us in the bureau to that and and provide a link to that or a reference. Um, so, but we're we're really focusing on the resilience assessment now from an ISC standpoint, and um, and I'll move. Well, we're doing that, and then we have two other pieces that I mentioned briefly. We'll move into this adaptation strategy development piece in October through to, uh, December after the Water Resources Research Conference. And then November into next March, we'll do the plan and recommendation piece. Next slide. And so here's a list of um, webinars and active actions uh, that will be coming on uh, you know, over the next few months on this resilience assessment and next steps. In particular, uh, today, I want to point you to the blue um, box in the middle of this slide that talks about resilience assessment initiation September meetings. So there we are, September 20th at 2 p.m. This is the first of these assessments on agriculture and livestock watering. Um, we'll have another one on Wednesday this week of public water supply systems and domestic wells. We will have an, a, a follow-up uh, and another presentation on the 28th of September next week on watersheds and habitat. Um, and maybe we should be thinking about that as watersheds, rivers, and habitat. But this is uh, really looking at the environmental pieces of the assessment. Uh, September 29th on industrial, commercial, mining, and power. And then following up uh, on the 30th of September with recreation and quality of life. Um, these are high level kind of presentations trying to get input from each of these different communities and user groups about the way that they look at resilience and helping us to frame our questions and how we would look at it broadly. There will also be in-depth webinars starting tomorrow um, uh, on two aspects that we actually have a significant amount of data on. Uh, one is evaluating resilience of irrigated agricultural areas, and then on the 23rd, the same with public water systems. So if you really want to dive into the, the, the detail of data and other types of information that's utilized, please take a look at those two websites. Um, and I would also say if you're uh, going to attend these webinars over the next week or so, we, we really look forward to that and look forward to your engagement. I would tell you the first half an hour for each of these webinars will probably be very consistent with what John, Mom, and I are presenting in the first half an hour today. So if you've heard it once, you, 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 uh, you probably don't need to come into the presentation on the other ones in that first half an hour because the, the, the specifics about each of these uh, re resilience assessments will, will come in the, in the latter part of them. And, um, and for the resilience, this whole set of work is building on the first element and second element, and a little bit of the third that you see in the next blue box off on the right. And so in mid-October, we plan to do a release of surveys on resilience for the, the, the focus areas that we've heard back from our communities about. And um, so that's the point where we'd really be asking you to, to look at each of those individual surveys and weigh in about these sectors of use that you're most concerned about. Today is about helping us design what those look like. The surveys will be mid-October, and then we'll move on to um, uh, New Mexico Water Resources Research Conference in October. And I'll just mention, 
that uh, we'll also be working with the Corps of Engineers to pull all of this information together. Yeah, John, I think you're right. Moving on to the next slide is a good idea. And so uh, let's just talk a little bit about how we're thinking of approaching the outreach and the interaction on resilience. So the uh, the graphic on the left side of this, you know, shows New Mexico, and it shows the climactic regions of the state. Um, you know, from the basin and range uh, down in the area of Lordsburg and Deming, you know, up through the Southern Plains, the Rio Grande Rift, and the Colorado Plateau, and then the the Southern Rocky Mountains pieces. We're thinking that when we look at assessing resilience from what we've seen so far from the leap ahead analysis that using these climactic regions as a, you know focus points for the assessments would be a good way to go forward um, look at them individually and then pull them together by water use sector for climatic regions so that's a, a first thing that we would like you all to think about based on what we've seen, and we can have discussion about that a little bit later on. Because um, really, we, we want those discussions to help inform us on, you know, and, and the community ultimately on how to maintain and improve resilience um, in each of these uh, climactic regions and for sectors to achieve sustainability, equity, and stewardship goals, and then how to develop and prioritize and implement adaptation strategies to achieve those goals. Big picture, here's how we're thinking of approaching this. So, you know, again, not individual uh, agricultural areas by themselves or farms, but these kinds of climactic regions. John, could you move to the next slide? And so um, with that, I will, point back again to the leap ahead analysis by um, the Bureau of, uh, of uh, Geology and Mineral Resources. I, I, you know, I also want to mention here for the people that are on the line today, um, when you take a look at that leap ahead analysis, you know, it's about physical science, peer reviewed science for the state of New Mexico. Um, if you again, if you um, if you know of other peer review science in those areas, please provide that information to the Bureau of Reclamation. But in addition, you know, if you are aware of peer review science more on the biological side of things, um, that that actually you know supports or ties in with this leap ahead analysis, looking forward 50 years. We, we do want to hear about that because we know that's a logical next step here, right? And, um, and so those are all the things that are the, the natural system uh, pieces that would, would go into ultimately closing out this 50-year water plan. We also have on that natural system biological side, the human piece of that. And I would, I would just let you all know that that human piece with regards to changing demographics population and so on, ultimately will be pulled in in the next version of the state water plan, which is scheduled um, tentatively now for some time in late 2023. Um, next slide. So um, when it comes to the leap ahead analysis report, you have that in front of you. I want to make it clear here, it's not the 50-year plan. It, it's It's the it is a supporting information piece for the 50-year plan that's based on physical science. And I believe the researchers and the Bureau have done a really good job on this piece. And um, I won't, I think you probably heard uh, the pieces that are in here and who has been engaged on that. So I won't dive into that now given the time, but I will talk a little bit about what they have uh, projected from that science. And John, that's the next slide. And um, unfortunately, you know, across the board for New Mexico, what we hear and what we read is uh, from this physical science work is the outcomes from increasing temperatures um, go towards increasing stresses on water, not less. And that's 
broadly across New Mexico. Um, the scientists have talked about decreased runoff from snowmelt and then recharge to our streams and aquifers um, from this increased warming, greater demands on groundwater, uh, an increase in hotter and longer droughts. As a result, uh, vegetation stress is increasing. So, you know, if you're a rancher across parts of New Mexico and you rely on, you know, early winter, spring rains to generate uh, moisture for initial growth of, of grasses and things like that, and then leading into the summer monsoon season without having to do uh, a whole lot of supplementation you know, how much can you really rely on in the future with that? Um, the aspect of increased forest fires, I think we've been very lucky the last few years um, in not having the types of fires in our forest that we've seen in Colorado last year and that we're seeing in Northern California this year. Um, and then the flooding and sediment transport issues that, uh, that arise from that the irreversible damage to soils that occurs and how that then translates to degraded quality of our surface waters. Wish the, um, the outcomes were different, but this is what the science is saying we're facing and we need to be prepared for. So um, John, is the next slide mine or yours? I believe the last one's yours and then I take over next. All right, perfectly. So. So where does that lead us? And, and this is kind of where John's gonna go. We know um, we've been experiencing changing conditions and we've been experiencing increased temperatures um, in different ways in different parts of New Mexico. And that has um, really affected precipitation and also increased evapotranspiration. We're, we're dealing with that and many of you are dealing with it today. So we really need to plan for resilience to together. And here's how we're proposing to define resilience. And we've kind of gone back and forth with uh, uh, a number of different approaches. We're still open to that, but, but this is kind of where we're settling. So it's the ability to anticipate, prepare for, and adapt to changing conditions, and then withstand, respond to, and recover rapidly from disruptions. Um, now we know that there's uh, you know have been major impacts and we know there's vulnerabilities we know those vul vulnerabilities affect resilience and so how do we become resilient and what do we need to prepare many of you in the in the farming and ranching communities have been doing this for a long time we we know that you know from a a sequia standpoint from a pueblo standpoint from a tribal standpoint to a ranching standpoint and so on, irrigated agriculture. Um, give us some ideas here about how you assess your own resilience and what you've done to prepare. And, um, and how will you do that? Well, again, through today, through this webinar, here in just a little bit, and then the online surveys that John will describe. And John, I will hand it to you next. All right. So the next uh, bunch of slides are just about the climatic impacts that are coming uh, from aridity and temperature increase. Um, again, our, our water future, we're expecting a more drier and more variable uh, environment. It's anticipated to continue, you know, continue changes in the climate will mean less water is available. While our demands might or might not increase many on population, um, given this new reality, we, you know, we must plan ahead to ensure that we can uh, continue to, you know, ensure economic, economic development and, uh, and also uh, plan ahead to make sure that, you know, we can, we can handle these changes. Um, first thing, I also, I'm going to launch a poll. So as you're listening in this, you can uh, take the poll. Uh, it should be a drop down on your screen. Um, it's just a yes or no. Um, I'll kick a few of these out before we get to the discussion part after these slides. So that should be out.
Right. Give a little time for this. But um, again, the, the question to the poll is, do you feel you understand the changes that are coming? Again, we've gone through a lot of this in the past webinars in the leap ahead. Um, it's just to see where um, most of our are at. Okay. And uh, about 90% um, say yes. So again, you know, um, the changes are coming. Hopefully in the next slide, we can kind of hit on what these, what they mean, what these changes. Again, uh, temperature change in New Mexico. Um, again, what we're looking at is a, a temperature increase that will, will occur throughout this the entire state but primarily um the highest will happen in our northwest corner of the state again uh that ralph touched on earlier these climatic regions based on elevation um based on uh the topography and and, and the area that um the, the where you are at and that really is going to dictate a lot of these changes that are coming um, as we see in this on this map, uh, it, it's pretty obvious you can't um, say the entire state is going to change exactly the same. But that you know, to to look at everything as the changes are coming will show these changes. So again, um, this is a simulation from the the leap ahead uh, analysis, and and again, you're looking at um, temperature increase throughout the entire state, especially the northwest. Again, um, looking at um, our, our entire national water stress index, um, this is a, a projected change in water stress by the the mid mid century uh, compared to the historical average uh, of water. Um, and while we're seeing on the eastern half half of our country, they're going to expect more water. The western side of the U.S. is going to have more water stress. And New Mexico is no exception to that. Again, with drought and and the increase in temperature and um, the increase in aridity, we're we're really going to see more um, water stress to to our system. Again, uh, potential evapor evaporation increase throughout the state. Uh, it's it's projected that our annual rate of uh, potential evapotranspiration, which is evaporation, is water leaving open ponds and soils and transpiration is water vapor leaving uh, trees and grass and crops and, and and so the potential is if it was a perfect environment uh, we had energy and we had water available that would be the potential evapotranspiration level of what we're predicting the actual is usually less uh, but it's with potential you are able to Act, you know, kind of uh, estimate what is coming into the future and project. And so we're going to see increase with that will occur throughout the entire state. Uh, and these increases result in an increase in water demand for vegetation. Um, increase, you know, demand because it's going to require more uh, water to for for those crops to grow as they do now. And it's something to to think about, especially in the agricultural field. Uh, with that, um, the increase in uh, potential evapotranspiration uh, causes with the increase in temperature is going to push uh, the aridity index up uh, again. Um, this is from the leap ahead again. What it's showing is is how our our average aridity index from from 1970 th through 2000 and um the average array index uh from 2040 through 2069 projections and, and it kind of shows how uh, it is increasing and then the one on the right is, is what um the ratio of what the difference of the the historical and future projections are and it's showing that we're going to have an increase in aridity and um that's coming from that increase in temperatures and, and and from that you're going to get a drier environment more drought and again increase in evapotranspiration making it more demand on your crops um, requiring more water to 
to use for, you know, to plumb ditches to 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 deal with uh, an environment that's drier. Um, here's an overview of of uh, kind of the the decrease we're looking at uh, with our flow flow reductions. Um, this is again from the leap ahead, uh, uh, looking at um, reductions in the Upper Colorado. Again, these are our, our projections um, based on the emissions level, but it, every one of them is showing kind of this is this decrease uh, of the runoff, and, and and it's something to think about if we have a decrease in runoff, you know, and and, and flows into the future, it's especially going to affect our our issues. Uh, with uh, especially agricultural, uh, having that variable water. Um, this is a, a, a look at the ecosystem vulnerability in New Mexico. Um, we want to thank the, the New Mexico Forest uh, Department uh, for it, with their forest action plan that was put out in, in 2020. Uh, this is a map from that plan and it, and it looks at, it shows where climate change poses the greatest risk to the ecosystems, the ecosystem vulnerability, um, and and where where um, that vulnerability is. As you see, a lot of it is in areas that um, at, that are um, on your the eastern plains and and um, some into the the Rio Grande. So these are those ecosystem vulnerability based on the climate change coming. And it's something to to kind of wrap your head around of of how is that going to affect you where you're at again in these climatic regions. Again, wildfire uh, with the increased temperatures and the drier environment, you're going to have an increase of wildfire hazard. And, and this again from from the forest action uh, forest action plan. Um, this is looking at the wildfire hazard um, with burn probability and and the intensity. Um, throughout the state and, and the burn probability is the likelihood of fire will start or spread and then the fire intensity is the probability of the fire burning at a given intensity and just to give you an overview of of the of that you know occurring into the future and this is looking back uh, where we've had uh, major fires in the last 20 years um, uh, and, and kind of looking into you know that's over the last 20 years what is it going to be into the next 50 years is something to think about as we're talking about with these wildfires and the vulnerability of that that happening again with with fires you're going to get um ero post-fire erosion and an erosion is a big issue especially um with even without fires um you're going to have uh, um, harsher uh, weather, larger storms. So with that, you know, you're going to have erosion issues. And the map on the left is showing you erosion susceptibility classification based on the slope and soil erodibility. And then with the, the you know, post-fire hazard, if you take away the the actual uh, vegetation that holds that soil and then you damage it with the fire, you're going to create a bare and damaged soil that is more susceptible to erosion. You're going to have sediment loads in your riverways, which it you know makes it much more difficult to use that um, rainwater and river water for for irrigation and usage for stock. So it's something to think about. Um, even if you have pumps in the river or or a sickia with a head gate, it's something to think about with with these erosion issues. And again, you know, uh, we're going to kind of look at that that surface water discharge. Um, we're seeing, you know, decreases due to the snowpack, decrease in runoff and drought. And this is just kind of a, a look at the Rio Grande, kind of a, of of where we're kind of where we were, where we were at currently, and kind of where it's expected to projected to go in in different emission levels but it again you know it's continuously on a projection to keep on decreases decreasing due to you know the decreased snowpack runoff and drought um to kind of look at um you know just uh picking alfalfa as as a crop um uh, they uh on the 
the NOAA and, and IDIS, uh, they, they had alfalfa and cattle inventory that are located within a drought. This is just kind of a rundown over the last uh, 10 years to show the amount of drought that has occurred throughout the state and, and the amount of the percentage of alfalfa or cattle inventory throughout the state of New Mexico that are in a drought condition. And this kind of shows, you know, the that, you know, a lot of the time, especially currently, uh, a lot of the, the state is in this drought condition and um, seeing that continuing into the future uh, of what are we going to do about that issue. Again, this is a look at that again from the USDA, you know, the amount of crops and livestock in New Mexico experiencing drought um, currently. Um, both kind of look at about 60% of the alfalfa acreage, um, you know, is experiencing, you know, drought throughout the U.S. and 32% of the cattle inventory um, is experiencing it. So just a, a look at of where that drought is, what is occurring. Um, these, again, these maps are through drought.gov. You can look into it. Um, it kind of goes into the agricultural areas in the state of New Mexico, and, and it can look at different crops and things to see what, you know, these monitoring of the drought that's occurring currently and looking forward into the future. Again, soil moisture availability. Um, this is uh, from the root zone soil moisture drought indicator. Uh, again, this kind of looks at. Um, what it, what what kind of surface water and um, water is uh, soil moisture is at the root zone and as you can see root zone the root zone is low and decreasing in New Mexico um, uh, currently and so it's something to again with the drought currently where we're at uh, with a uh, uh, majority of uh, crops are in drought livestock areas are in in drought and you, we have a uh, uh, very uh, low soil moisture at the root zone level. And with all that, um, kind of looking at something that we talked about in 2018 uh, to kind of bring it around is infrastructure. Um, again, you know, we look back in 2018, the, uh, it was a large movement for, for projects and goals to improve on the infrastructure for agricultural. Again, costs have only increased since and will continue to increase as um, the infrastructure is vulnerable to these increased floods, fires, erosion, and the need for this to occur. And it's something to um, look at um, as we kind of talked about, again, we, we have an issue with the, you know, increase of aridity, um, increase of temperature, dryness, and drought. And with that, we're looking at, you know, we, we one of the big pieces is the infrastructure for an agricultural system. And so now um, we want to start our, our discussion. So we wanted to kind of go over all this information. Um, I'm going to open up another poll um, right now. It's like it's open here, John. What? It, I just say it's it's open here and looking forward to the results. I I would just tell also the people who are attending and are going to be part of the discussion here is, you know, again, uh, these graphics um, will be available on our website um, for you all to pull and to look at when you uh, you engage in the online survey. Uh, pieces of, um, of, uh, of of this resilience assessment, and they're in large part intended to help you think about it from the perspective of that first poll question to what John was just presenting here from the leap ahead and other pieces, and and really to kind of assess okay, are those is that initial kind of uh, of, of 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 value um, and and input the same after you see this set of results. So with that, so, John, do you, do you have the results? Yeah, or? yeah. so 100% of you are concerned of the, the changes coming. 
And then he, this is one about vulnerability. Um, and then after this, we'll, we'll just start a discussion uh, on, on the subject of, of these vulnerabilities and these concerns and these changes coming. Boy, would you have them select one? <laughs> I, thought, I thought it was a multi multiply. It, it just says select one, but I'm, uh, I guess that goes to what do you think for your specific, um, you know, concern is absolutely the most important to these, right? So. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Well, ninety percent are saying water availability is the the most vulnerability to these impacts, and the other are flooding and fires. So that's great. So, um, all organizers, I, I make sure that you guys have selected unmute all participants to make sure that we can start this discussion. Um, I believe it should be. Ralph, can you make sure that you have selected unmute all? Should be that, that green mic. Right? Unmute all. I'm looking for it right now under. Uh, I have uh, attendees can raise hands. Attendees can raise ask questions. So where sure. uh, the unmuted piece? Oh, hey, Ralph. It's a little microphone on the bottom of the list of attendees. It says. Uh, uh, all it's green unmute all should be okay now i think you it did you hit the unmute or the mute unmute all right um We'll start a discussion then, um, just to start kind of a, a topic to kind of touch on um, is, you know, looking at kind of the the dryness that's coming ex is um, what kind of where where are we most vulnerable and not just at a personal level, but also a community level uh, of agriculture. Again, a lot of those maps and, and kind of the next part where we talk about resiliency is looking at a larger scale than just at a, at a producer level. But um, where where are we, where are you all um, most vulnerable to these potential impacts as you see it? And I know the the poll is having issues. Um, feel free to unmute yourself and start a discussion. Um, Hello, uh, this is Mike Hammond uh, on the ISC, also uh, with the MRGCD. Just, just want to ask. Uh, the focus is primarily the agricultural and livestock arena, right? Is that the? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, we're we're not going to drift into other topics, but um, you know, obviously the water availability question. But uh, you know, when I looked at that list, it was a little hard for me to decide because. You know, we're uh, in the middle of Rio Grande. We're, we're vulnerable to all all of those, including an uh, an other, which would be endangered species issues that rise up when when water availability becomes a major concern as well. Um, <clears throat> but in terms of resiliency, I think if that's really kind of uh, the term here, I think I think you know we're we're governed by the Rio Grande Compact, and it's been a relatively resilient document, particularly since the spills of 1985, in terms of, uh, you know, allowing for a certain amount of storage, certain amount of use, and then deliveries, but but things have degraded. Um, when I look at the list, there's erosion and sedimentation, and there's various other things that are going on, um, and intrusion of, 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 uh, of much more uh, vegetation in the lower reaches of the Rio Grande above Elephant Butte. 
Um, and that's affected the resilience of our compact and the, the abilities to be resilient with our uh, with the cycle of life that we've had in the Middle Valley with the storage options, the San Juan Chama project that has been brought into the Middle Valley. All of those things are, are now at risk because uh, you know we're 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 struggling to meet our annual co compact obligations and have drifted into debit. So that 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 to me is a major, at least in the Middle Valley, a major resilient issue to be brought to the fore. Thank you, Mike. Can I, John? Can I add in there too? I mean, um, when I look at this and think about the questions, I just from my 20 or 30 years of doing this, look at the history. You know, this aspect of sediment and um, and erosion and uh, and what and sediment being transformed or transported into our river systems, and then how large uh, rain events and others can uh, really you know, destroy parts of the system. Um, you know, that was a part of the history of the Rio Grande, you know, from the 1920s up through the 1970s, where these very large federal projects came in all the way through up from El Paso, all the way up to Abiquiu Dam, you know, straightening the rivers, putting levees in, um, yeah, you know, putting some of those big flood control dams in. You know, are we likely to see a similar type of sediment uh, regime and, and 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 disruption regime with climate change to what was it what those people experienced a hundred years ago? Just to to follow on what Mike Hammond said. Absolutely. Um, and again, you know, at an agricultural end, you know, you it's also to think, you know, you have that the 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 sedimentation and issues like that. So even if you would increase your efficiency with pumps and stuff like that, it, it would you would be vulnerable to not being able to use that that kind of equipment and. Um, you know, it would, there's thoughts in that too, is, you know, if you set up a more efficient system on an, on a, you know, an agricultural uh, location, you know, on a farm, maybe piping and, and stuff like that, is it, is it going to be able to handle some of the issues that, that might come to be from, you know, increased sedimentation uh, and sediment loading? How how about some others in here? I know there are a lot of, um, of parties on here um, that you know are are not in the Rio Grande Basin, are in some other areas that uh, you know may have somewhat you know mainly reliable surface water, but not too much groundwater. Um, you know, uh, would any of you like to raise some of those issues and concerns there? Because we're we're also you know very much looking for uh, you know how you would well what what the issues you're struggling with how you try to deal with them and um, and 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 what you think would work. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> Hello. Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, hi. I'm. I wasn't here a hundred years ago, but almost. <laughs> uh, my name is John Hawley. I when I worked for the, one of the most interesting experiences in my career was three years with the uh, uh, U.S. Soil Conservation, now the NRCS, uh, stationed at Lubbock, and that that's a place where uh, their only source of water is groundwater. The cities, like the city of Lubbock or Amarillo, get most of their drinking water from uh, two sources, wells near uh, Portales, Mutual, and then they pipe water up from the Canadian River. And uh, that water is almost brackish. We had, uh, so 
you're dealing with uh, that's one area. Uh, the other area, of course, I spent most of my life is in the Rio Grande Valley. But uh, so there, if I'm in the Mesilla Basin, um, I, 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 I have to, uh, I have to rely on a combination of surface water and groundwater. And if we per, put water out to dry in Elephant Butte um, for recreation, which people really Did we lose John? John, right. you there? Oh. I'm unmuted. So anyway, uh, uh, the big thing is uh, T.S. Eliot and others observe humankind does not accept reality quite conveniently. You just pick up the newspaper. So we're in a cultural situation where reality is pretty hard to fathom and, or, or to take. So. Uh, what you're doing is awesome. Uh, you're bringing, I think you're reaching out and it's interesting because Zoom allows a whole bunch of people to participate that they couldn't before. I'm glad that you're here, John. And very much thank you for your input on this. I can uh, go over some. Go ahead. Hello? Okay. Uh, Kurt Anderson. Uh, I'm, among other things, a, a domestic water provider or involved with it. And our concern down here in the lower Rio Grande, that's defined as between Elephant Butte and Texas, uh, essentially everyone down here gets their water from groundwater. The only people who get surface water really are the Elephant Butte Irriga Irrigation District irrigators. Uh, and they get most of their water from groundwater now also. Uh, the only thing that recharges our aquifer of any significance is the Rio Grande River. And that only flows when, during irrigation season. Uh, the lack of water in the Rio means more pumping. At the lower end of the basin, I think uh, John will tell you, there are issues about the long-term destruction of the aquifer. You know, as you pump and pump and pump, uh, you get you get settlement, and uh, the, you know the porosity as well as the permeability of the aquifer decreases, and you can get more water later on, but it's not going to come back up. I think a, a real concern is the long-term health of the aquifer. Instead of uh, putting the water in Elephant Butte, where I learned decades ago, uh, New Mexico's water goes to evaporate, I suggest we uh, store it underground in the Mesilla Bolson. Thank you, Kurt. I, I, just to read off, uh, there, some people have shot in, you know, questions and and comments. I I see you you sent one in earlier, Kurt. Um, but here's a here's a few just a uh, of discussion pieces. Um, uh, we also have aquifer stress. Um, this uh, because folks will shift from shortened surface supplies to groundwater, and then. Um, there was a question about diminished snowpack in the future and um, and all, what is the planning being done for the Rio Grande in New Mexico, you know, to adjust for to cope with this absence of snowpack. And again, that's where um, the 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 piece that would be um, for that is is in our adaptation strategy piece. Uh, right now with this resiliency want to see kind of these vulnerabilities these pieces that we can kind of see if you're vulnerable to that change um it, are you able to adapt to it easily or not and then um with it um can you um with that as how do we plan for that absent is in our strategies and so 
I, I would say that's a big piece that we can touch on the 50 year plan. So are there any last uh, discussion pieces that anybody has or questions uh, before we kind of move on to the resiliency piece of this uh, presentation? If no, I, I was going to um, uh, go to the next slide. I'm going to introduce it and have Ralph take it. Uh, but um, just to kind of. John, John, this is Gloria. I got a message from Ralph. He got dropped. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm back, uh, Gloria. Yeah, I just okay. got restored. Right. Uh, John, if in this you lose me, just keep on going through it. it might okay. Be, I think it's just fine. Okay. Sounds good. Well, we're going to go to the next slide, everybody. Uh, uh, if you have questions and stuff, hold them to the end. We have another discussion piece like this again. It will give you kind of the chance to see what we're talking about with the resiliency too. So, um, but um, I want before Ralph uh, uh, goes with the resiliency piece, I, I want to make sure that um, when with the maps and stuff that we have for the resiliency is at a at a larger scale, kind of a, more of a regional area. Um, base and we were not able to kind of cut down the the matrix or the criteria for single producers and so um that is something to think about as you look at the matrix and we did ask in our survey that will be available today uh, about that how do we look at resilience at a single producer instead of just for an entire secchia or an entire irrigation district um, how would we, you know, measure that resiliency for a single producer? So it's something to think about. I'm going to let Ralph take this and uh, um, start on the resilience part of this presentation. All right. Thanks, John. And um, so, you know, I want to start with uh, just an acknowledgement that within New Mexico, uh, for the state, federal, local side of things, lots of work on resilience has been going on. Um, you know, we, uh, you know, we have a list though of agricultural infrastructure needs that John put up a little while ago versus, you know, the actual amount of work that's been done on the ground. And I, I wanted to point out a few of these things and, um, and, uh, and see, well, just kind of direct you to them and think about where we're, you know, basically focusing a lot of our efforts. So. You know, within New Mexico, we, we, we've gone through long-term drought, right? Um, with our, our tribes, Pueblos, and the Acequias, um, you know, for hundreds, if not longer years, have been relying on irrigated agriculture um, as a major food source going forward. And they've made it through those time periods. Um, we, we know from what the scientists are telling us, that we should expect similar droughts in the future, but they will be hotter and longer than what we've experienced. And uh, and I would just say that you know the the period of record that we have for data on this really goes almost 120, 130 years, and and we know from tree ring analyses that droughts, you know, prior to these times on a number of occasions were significantly worse within New Mexico. So within that, we have communities that have histories of being resilient. And we want to hear from those communities. <clears throat> Are we missing something <clears throat> as a state, excuse me, in what we're doing? Now, you know, when it comes to irrigated ag, there's money going to a number of different projects across the state for the ISC alone. The governor and legislature have ded dedicated over $16 million to Asakians and community ditch infrastructure improvements just in the last two years. We have like about 175 individual projects going on, you know, that the ISC supporting that these volunteer communities are putting on the ground. Um, you know, that that's just one example. Um, but in addition, and this really goes, I think, more to drinking water supplies um, than to, um, to irrigated ag, but we have over $2 billion that I'm aware of, we're aware of that has been invested 
just in those efforts. And we don't show Eastern New Mexico rural water pipeline on here, but it's another real big piece. From an irrigated ag standpoint, I know um, from some of our activities on the Southwest New Mexico side, Middle Rio Grande, and uh, on the Pecos River, there are activities going on there, but it, I don't think they're the same magnitude as what we see for um, you know, uh, drinking water supplies. Um, but we're focusing efforts as a state into these areas. We're working to protect water rights, both Indian and non-Indian through the system, and, um, and protecting um, existing supplies. Uh, we know, and Mike Hammond you know, uh, spoke a, a little bit earlier, you know, the MRGCD has, in my experience, in the last uh, 20 some years, really changed up the way it conveys and moves water through the system for multiple purposes, you know, for the farmers that also supports the environment and a number of things. It's a miraculous, um, you know, kind of a change in the way that they do that, that I haven't seen in the other places that I've been um, doing work in the in the Southwest recently, you know, um, where, where supplies are so limited and these other activities have gone forward. Um, same thing, I will just mention, um, you know, Pecos Valley Artesian Conservancy District or CID and others too, um, you know, with basic, basically activities there to look at long-term sustainability for use of that, that world-class aquifer system on the Pecos River. Lots of, of examples, lots of things that have been done on the ground. And from my perspective, anecdotal information, you know, about that and what has worked and what has not worked relative to, you know, here's what, here's how we fill these gaps. So we're, we're going to be looking for input on those things, but we know you all have been doing this. We know the state's been doing it, the federal government, and there's a, a large amount of work that's been done today to improve resilience across the state. Uh, John, next slide. So, but, you know, within that, if we think about where the money piece I just depicted was going was to that blue piece that's really in there, public water supply systems. When for agriculture, it's, um, you know, 76% approximately of, uh, of New Mexico's water use, you know, are we, are we are we focused enough on um, you know this agricultural piece and the um, the actual funding amounts to it to support it, recognizing how big of a water user it is? Next. And so when we're looking at um, agricultural resilience, we're primarily taking a look at that from a water supply standpoint now or thinking about it that way. Um, of course, there's other ways to look at that from a demand perspective. And I, I want to point here also to just a, something we want to ask you and have discussion about. We know that um, Think New Mexico, New Mexico Department of Ag and a number of others have been really focused for a number of years on agricultural resilience work. And that a significant amount of effort has put into that and products have been developed. For the work that we're doing, we, we really do want input and thoughts of, you know, is that work where we really need to focus when we're looking at the 50 year plan element? Um, or, you know, is this resilience um, kind of questionnaire process that we're doing um, the right way to go? Do they build on one another or not? Because we know there's a ton of work that, you know, that has been done in that area, um, New Mexico Department of Ag and, and a number of others. So just something to be keeping in the back of your mind as we, we kind of go through these uh, thought pieces. So in the surveys, we're, we're planning to uh, look at a number of water supply parameters. And what's on here is just kind of a listing that we would look at to assess, um, you know, relative risks. And so the first of those under water supply parameters 
is the number of sources of water and their reliability availability. You know, are there multiple surface water diversion points on different streams? They have one well or more well to meet their needs. Um, the idea there being, if you have more sources of supply and more diverse, could potentially be more resilient, assuming you know those sources of supply all don't dry out at the same time. Um, as we heard just a few minutes ago, you know there's some places that uh, might be um, reliant only on groundwater, um, some only on surface water, or sometimes both. I would point out that if you're on the San Juan system in New Mexico, you, you really don't have a significant groundwater supply as a backup. It's really just surface water that, that you might have. Um, and, and some places in the state have groundwater only and some places both. We wanna really kind of, um, we think basically by looking at those pieces, we can help to assess resilience on a kind of a broad scale. Then, um, you know, in addition, is there a surface water uh, supply that's directly from a stream? So is that a direct flow system? I uh, know Mike Hammond is, uh, is, is working and has to, had to deal with that where, you know, 80 or 90% of the supply is just three days in front of you with a little bit of reservoir storage versus, you know, a system, and I'll just uh, pick up Navajo Reservoir here, um, where you know the the supply for something like uh, uh, Navajo Indian Irrigation Project or others is solely uh, from that reservoir. Um, and then is the groundwater supply reliable? Meaning in this case, is it of good quality and would it provide a full supply or most of a full supply in a given year? Th you know, these are the pieces of things we're thinking about of putting together in a list and asking for input from individual farmers or groups in, in these different climactic regions that are here. What's not on here, and I would ask you if it should be, is how much does a farmer or rancher uh, really rely on also precipitation to meet some of their um, agricultural needs here? I mean, think of it from a forage standpoint and others. Don't have it listed, because in most parts of the state, our understanding is, uh, you know, that might be good to have at certain times, but at other times it's not. So just a marker for you all to think about. And then um, moving from water supply parameters to the next slide, um, we it, it looks at, you know, is the infrastructure of sufficient capacity to address the projected changes? Given that we know we're looking at potentially an earlier runoff uh, and reduced supply, you know, is the infrastructure sufficient to provide that to, with different sources of supply, uh, raw water storage of some sort, uh, or sufficient conveyance and irrigation setup uh, in order to more efficiently and effectively deliver the supply that's there? And, and I would again point out for the Conservancy District in the last 20 years, um, a big part of their effort has gone to that kind of gray um, uh, you know, uh, bullet point in this one. And so we're, we're kind of, we're trying to figure out how exactly do we frame that of this aspect of having, you know, a reduced supply, but perhaps having these different infrastructure pieces in place that help you, can help you carry through. Next slide. And, and so in that regard, you know, this slide, the, the figure on the right is uh, assessing um, resilience of water systems within the state. And it's really tied to uh, flow in streams. Um, I wanna bring up a couple of points on this graphic. You know, it's, it's focused on our, our major streams that are in here and it's the general statement is if you have more water uh, in that stream, then you have greater resilience, you know, and, you know, if you look at this, it would basically look at the San Juan system, parts of the middle Rio Grande and the lower Rio Grande being, having the most chance of being resilient with others being less. Does that 
comport with the way that that you are seeing things with regards to your resilience? I, I certainly, when I look at this, I have questions about that. And then, you know, there's large parts of the state that aren't depicted on here. Is that a lack of data and something that we need to be assessing, you know, through the Water Data Act? Um, you know, if there is data, you know, what type of data is it? How could we assess it? Because, you know, um, we we would want to really assess if this is makes sense to people as a way of looking at surface water availability or not. Next slide. So this one just goes to um, you know availability of storage water for uh, various parties for irrigated agriculture. Red being the lower piece, blue being the higher piece of this. Um, you know the um, just something for you all to utilize because as as we get input from um, the stakeholder groups on resilience. We'd be looking at these types of graphics to basically try to do some validation and then reach back and ask questions on this. Um, you know, the areas that are highlighted here in red, um, in you know, particularly in the northern New Mexico pieces of this, from um, from my experience, those are also places that don't have a lot of groundwater. Um, so that red makes a lot of sense in, in that regard to me. Uh, next slide. So this next piece is about demand management and the ability to access dollars to make changes or do things on the ground. Um, and, um, and, and we are still kind of trying to uh, assess just how this would fit in. But for example, with the Interstate Stream Commission, uh, with our new Asakia Community Ditch Infrastructure Fund and the process we're putting in place there, as you know, we identify or ASAKIs and stuff identify additional problems, there's a vehicle for funding to be able to be uh, allocated for planning and permitting um, and developing shovel ready projects for ASAKI and uh, community ditch uh, members that are, you know, because those are political subdivisions of the state and they can directly receive um, funding through the ISC for projects, either through capital projects, uh, through our ACDIF, or through our 9010 program. Um, similar situation exists, um, you know, for irrigation and conservancy district members. Um, and, um, and, you know, those are places that within um, the state of New Mexico or governmental bureau bureaucratic organizations if there are specific problems that are identified in gaps, there are existing funding mechanisms and streams that can bring money to bear on the ground for those problems. So I just wanted to highlight that from a kind of a, a, a the ability to get more water to people to put money on the ground for projects. Then um, we were also looking at it from the perspective of in this, you know, how many of these parties out there have drought or flood emergency plans in place. You know, we're going to have a much more variable system, longer droughts, more uh, higher floods. What are people doing to plan for that? Uh, uh, because having a plan in place and, and having, you know, prepared for these types of events could really improve resiliency. Shortage sharing agreements and are they in place? Uh, you know, there's there's a number of these that are going on within New Mexico today under the Active Water Resource Management stand, uh, uh, Statute, uh, Rio Chama, uh, you know, the Gallinas, uh, the um, Animas River. Um, and in fact, I would say big piece of this going on today throughout the Middle Rio Grande. And they make big differences in, in the ability to move and, uh, and get water for various uh, purposes under really dire circumstances. And then, um, you know, when we get to demand management pieces of this, should we be looking at other types of 
um, elements in the matrix? And if so, how would we take those into account? So some idea of self-supplied water here, which might be, you know, you're, you're not a member of these, any of these other things, and you're, you're basically just getting water from yourself from a particular source. Um, you know, is there the ability to do partial season irrigation and still have a viable operation? How about, you know, other cropping techniques? Heck, we know that, you know, particularly in the 1950s drought, lots of on-farm efficiency improvements went on in certain places and those made a difference. Is there a next step in that regard? And then, um, and then you know, is there something else there that we should be thinking about from a matrix standpoint to put in that actually is something that we could measure and report on? So that piece in place. John, uh, next slide. Something for you all to, to look at here. Um, you know, um, where we have groundwater availability. Mike Hammond framed here just a bit ago um, the interstate compact related activities. I, I would tell you that in many other states that I've been uh, working with in the last few years when they've had dry conditions, you know, everybody goes to drill in a whole bunch of different wells and pump in a whole lot of water. And so some of the um, issues that we heard about a little bit earlier about subsidence and other things come into play very quickly. For New Mexico, particularly in our compacted basins, uh, that's not really the case because um, you know those areas um, can only you know drill new wells or put them in place if you're transferring an existing water right into that existing location, and so it's a, a attempt to uh, balance out the supply. But it's also a, a limit on the amount of pumping that can occur under these climate change conditions. So it's a big part of the state that's covered by these. Um, next. So I, I brought up this and I, my, I think, you know, it was brought up a little bit before, but, um, and you know, water availability is definitely high on everybody's list, but this eros, uh, erosivity risk and irrigation locales piece, um, you know, if, if, if I was responding to this and I had a choice of two, I would probably put this as high as the water availability. If you're in the lower Rio Grande in the 1920s and 30s, um, where it was almost impossible to irrigate because of sublands, you know, associated with the Rio Grande project and the destruction of the river channel through El Paso um, and the rebuilding that needed to go in place that we rely on today. Middle Rio Grande, the Middle Rio Grande project, um, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, even in 1930s and 50s dollars. I don't know what it would cost today, um, but basically having large fires, um, the the in higher intensity events in our watersheds brings me great concern relative to what sediment it may do in our system. And I would just ask you all as you're looking through this stuff to see if that resonates for yourselves uh, or not, because it's one of the things we would like to put on our list. And John, next uh, next slide. Oh, I can, so, okay. yeah, yeah, go ahead, you wanna take this one? Because this is kind of what we're thinking of doing. Yeah, so um, just to, what Ralph has kind of gone over is the, the big picture of, of, of how we're looking at resilience for agricultural, um, again, this is um, a draft of, of looking at that with all the climatic shocks and, and uh, criteria that um, covers those issues of supply and demand. Um, again, um, focusing on agricultural and again, um, the one we really want to input is possible, how would we put in, you know, uh, uh, as an individual producer, but this is a draft of what we're looking at where you have a criteria with parameters that allows you to see um, how, how resilient you are where with your diversity of water supply portfolio having uh, more of a mix of surface water and groundwater, um, the ability, you know, having 
where your uh, diversion is, whether the river has more minimum, higher minimum flows than other streams. And again, some of this stuff is not um, of, a, of a resiliency that for supplies, such as the minimum flow of streams, some of those things you can't actually, um, uh, there's, an, based on your location, you know, in the stream, maybe the minimum flow, it dries up every year, your, your resiliency will be low for that issue with the conditions coming. And that's what we're trying to see is, what is your level for these changes coming? If, if you know, and, and looking at this, but we want to get input from the public on this. So this is what um, a draft we have to, to look at your level of resiliency. We do have a survey out. Uh, again, this is also on there. So when you take that, this will be on there for you to kind of look into that to remind you. I did put the link in the chat. Um, the chat should be up, um, and it the the uh, link to that survey is there. Um, and again, um, we we want your input on how to evaluate that resilience on an agricultural level. Um, and, and we're going to have that survey open for about ten days because it's a little tight on the timeline. But we want to get see what how can we adjust that um, resiliency uh, assessment piece where we can um, kind of have people assess themselves and see where are they at currently um, uh, with these changes coming. And again, we're gonna um, have a discussion. I, I did get some um, good comments throughout the resiliency piece, um, but um, this is where we, we wanna hear um, some input, just discussion of uh, in evaluating resilience in, in New Mexico's egg systems, you know, what's missing What what from what we shared today? Um, are your communities thinking about this and planning for resilience? What is the best way to get that discussion going? And how does this discussion about resilience best support our next steps of, you know, development, implementation of adaptation strategies? So um, feel free to unmute yourselves and, and um, we can start a discussion about this. I do have one question that was submitted. Uh, Ralph, maybe um, it's something that you could answer and it could start the discussion. Um, it is on how will resilience of the Rio Grande in New Mexico be affected by the result of Texas v. New Mexico litigation? Well, I think the ultimately the US Supreme Court will um you know provide a decision and direction um you know relative to that court case and that will say it set the framework you know for what new mexico needs to do in the lower rear grant going forward um i'm hesitant to say anything more about what i think about that today although you know i think for those of you who are on the call you know that the I guess the the trial's been bifurcated in that case, and there'll be fact expert witnesses that are heard um, this fall, and then the main trial will um, commence next March. I don't know how long it'll go. Uh, that suggests to me that it's going to be some time, at least a year, if not 18 months, before. Um, there is a, a decision out of the U.S. Supreme Court on this issue. Thanks, Ralph. I do see some people that have hands up. Feel free to unmute yourself. I think Isabel. Are you on? There you go. Yes, hello. My name is Isabel Yanichus. I'm with the Healthy Soil Working Group. And um, what I'm missing is um, the soil piece in, in this conversation. Um, you know, really in terms of resiliency, uh, soil health touches on so many of the parameters that, that you mentioned, just um, in terms of evaporation, for example, um, you could measure ground cover or something like that, which has a huge uh, influence on, on the ev evaporation rate, and it's a big problem in New Mexico. 
Um, the other one could be, you know, water availability. So if you just measure organic matter in the soil, for example, you could uh, go with the NRCS, uh, which they're saying that 1% increase in organic matter can result in up to 20,000 gallons of available soil water per acre. So if you think about soil really as part of your infrastructure, and I think farmers and ranchers are doing that, um, then uh, you can see how it's storage, um, how it's um, you know a filter for quality as well. And, and so many of these uh, quite scary facts that you shared today would be, um, you know, would be, we would be able to influence them through our management. So I think that's that's a huge piece um, that we should not forget uh, when when we make our evaluation here. So that really, I mean, like agriculture and our working lands can be a solution. Um, it's it's actually a very hopeful message. Thank you for that input. I do have a, a question that uh, came in. Um, it is, it seems that a lot of lower Rio Grande is being switched over to orchard. Is that moving the area into much lower resilience? And um, just so again, if I will, let me pop back to that. Um, kind of the crop and pattern, um, what that is, is if you have a, you know, with a permanent crop, um, uh, it the the ability to adapt um, with that uh, permanent crop it doesn't allow you to adjust. Um, it's uh, so so it it would be by you know this discussion input that that would be a less resilient uh, piece um, because you wouldn't be able to. Um, alter what crops are using, uh, uh, adapt to uh, maybe, uh, can, you know, with, that, with the less water and having a permanent crop, you can't uh, adapt to the changes coming. And so that's what that touches on. So to that question, um, let's see. Um, oh. On that point, um, in the Mesilla Valley, which has this uh, a large conversion to uh, uh, pecan orchards, particularly, um, it depends on how you irrigate that orchard. There are large areas in Mesilla Valley. If you irrigate properly, you recharge the aquifer. If you don't irrigate properly, you do not recharge the aquifer. So, John, would you frame that as a um, irrigation application methodology piece yeah. there that needs to be put in? Yeah. Oh, I think it's John Hawley, but yeah. Pardon? Well, I, you know, so I, you know, I was thinking about the the, the the discussion that's going on, and I was thinking about the parameters, John. And you know, we heard uh, from Isabel before about the the soil health condition piece of, of it and then from um, and we heard about the, the cropping pattern piece but I was trying to think in my own mind uh, about where and how uh, the issue that you just brought up which is you know irrigation methodology um, you know towards resilience and how that might fit and, and I was trying to think about what that parameter might be and get your thoughts on it. Uh, we do you have a day or two? <laughs> you don't. Um, <laughs> no, it's it's an uh, you have to have soils that are connected to the aquifer. In the for instance, in the Rincon Valley, there is no aquifer under the irrigated lands. Uh, and so the water that percolates into the alluvium aquifer below, that water keeps on going down the valley and it, it shows up it, uh, and it's transported. It's very effective. Uh, and then when you get into Mesilla Valley, which is uh, one of the, like the Albuquerque Basin, 
is underlain by an enormous aquifer that could be a place to store water, uh, as Kurt Anderson mentioned a few minutes ago. Those are, you have to design with nature uh, and, and you have to know, uh, you have to integrate your soil survey with your hydrologic survey. And, uh, and the, the secret to me is um, one uh, spent my life working with Pueblos and with uh, Soil Conservation Service. It's, we have to get people in cities and their urban runoff management and farmers uh, it's it's the key words are membership and community and if once we feel like we're part of a community whether we're in a formal district or not then we start to react but right now uh I, I was with the federal government for 15 years and I left because it we started to manage people rather than manage resources. So it's a we have to feel like we're part of the system and that's what's broken right now from an old 90 year old guy talking. When was your 90th birthday, John? It'll be well. I, I, my body turns ninety in January. All right, that's what I, I was. I was wondering if I missed that feast because I, I want to be talking with you well past that point. But, but you know, the for the discussion piece that we're doing here, I really appreciate it because what we're trying to do with the resilience assessment piece is reach out to the local communities and individuals, understand what they're dealing with and how they're dealing with things and 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 how they really look at their risk, what they've done and what others could do to be no. more resilient. Because we, we know that that expertise exists there out on the ground. And uh, and that's really a big piece of what we're trying to get out of this process. So um, in looking at the surveys and what we're dealing with there, we'll think about that some more. Um, but definitely for the for the, all the people that are on, if you have thoughts about that and how you know it because it, it, it what John is talking about is uh, you know community conversations or sets of issues that are not easily put into a matrix. And I don't want to lose, you know, that that information piece, but at the, at the same time, we, we want to be able to kind of, um, you know, utilize this process to, to focus on where things are going really well, where they're not going so well, and, and how all those parts can learn from the others. So obviously the matrix is not that place, but we're hoping the surveys that we come out of it and the adaptation strategy that comes subsequently, November, December time period with the, um, you know, uh, with the water dialogue is a place where we could carry that forward. So John, uh, you know, for you leading up to your birthday and for others the the thought that that i was having is you know help us with the matrix piece here what are the things we need to think of with questions that leads into that next piece which are those discussions about adaptation strategies uh you know parties working together to mutually good outcomes so just donate to the md anderson cancer center to tell them to keep me going for a few right. more years. That's all you have to do. All right, we've all heard that. I'm into it. Thanks, John. Hey, yes. um, yeah, go ahead. No, you go ahead, bro. You know, I, I just I wanted to 
to basically reach out and you know to other people who are on the list and either through chat, the discussion piece, any way that you want to provide input to us today, or you know through the online survey, we really do want to to get that, and we want to have uh, as much discussion as you all are interested in here. And and I, with that, I wanted to to basically ask Teresa Cardenas if she might be up to uh, to saying a few things about uh, I think New Mexico and the agricultural resilience work that's gone on and your thoughts on how these things mesh or don't mesh, Teresa? I'm sorry to, um, to, to highlight you there in that regard, but I see now your hand is raised, so. Yeah, so it looks like I'm unmuted now. I was muted. And I was just going to put my hand up. <laughs> Thanks, Rolf, for calling on me. <laughs> um, yeah, so we we have been hosting. Um, so I'm from New Mexico first, and, and I'm the policy manager and uh, civic engagement um, person, you know, that, that is in charge of this ag plan that was put together um what seven years now it's been about seven years for seven years um a group of individuals have been meeting and they're usually they're leaders in in the field of agriculture or there could be a rancher or farmer that you know really want to be involved in the discussions that happen once a month and there are four different groups um of individuals and i will talk about that in just a second but what i wanted to say when they look at resilience when the ad plan uh, looks at resilience it doesn't it looks at different components of resilience such as the value chain the food system and economic viability um, and then there's um, land and water so it, it it's not it's not just a one one-way conversation it has many different parts and pieces to it um, because agriculture is um, a big part of our culture it's a big part of our economy um, our history so it, it has to have all those different components in it so the ad plan really is a uh, a community of people like john holly was talking about um, and it, there is a membership to it because you either were involved in the convening from the beginning or people just, you know, started, you know, be, they started showing up to the meetings. So I, I wanted just to talk about this resilience matrix. I think that um, agriculture, the, the folks in agriculture can really help elevate the resilience the they they'll be able to add more components on to it because they don't look at ag they don't just talk about ag and water they talk about ag and the value of of having agriculture and perhaps it's part of their um you know their um, business it's their business so so there's so many different parts and pieces that it's it's kind of hard to narrow down you know what how can we work on resilience but it's not an impossible task but it's not a, a it's not a something that's going to you fix overnight it's it's a process and it has to happen over time um and it, there has to be ongoing conversations around it Well, so anyway, is that what you were looking for? Well, no, that's wonderful. I I I just I had heard you um, a week or so ago, and I was thinking about this aspect of the complexity of any of these kind of water use sectors that we're looking at, and and trying to think about them in the context of not duplicating efforts, but but finding ways to to. Um, to build on existing efforts, and um, and then and then you know this aspect of you know our push here is the 50-year water plan piece, right? And so there's the the factual kind of direct pieces that are water uh, that we think about and we put on here, and then there's a whole host of 
of other potential things to bring on. And that the question that comes to my mind and, and that we're wrestling with is how much should we really try to take on here and how much do we kind of direct to other places and other driving lanes where there's potentially parties that know a whole lot more um, you know about that petition particular sector and um, and and you know that's uh, I, I, right now I don't know that we 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 know the right answer to that but um, but I think about it for one of the upcoming uh, segments that uh, of webinars that we're going to have to do that has to do with the forest and watershed health and habitat. Um, you know that uh, there's a lot of planning work going on within other state agencies, and I'll just you know give a shout out here to Energy, Minerals, and Natural Resources on the forestry side. Um, that goes into much greater depth than anything we might be able to do here. And I think our goal in that regard is is really to to kind of do something that is synergistic with what forestry is already doing, right? And I think the same exists here when it comes to efforts that New Mexico Department of Ag, that um, you know that New Mexico First and and others are doing. And we'd like to figure out how to best layer those things and not duplicate efforts but get at the heart of the water issues for what we're dealing with. Um, any, any input, any help that people can get us in that regard, very much appreciated, including this, hey, this has already been done, it's been assessed, and here's where you need to go to look. Um, we wanna hear that full range of input. Hope that, that, that includes you guys, Teresa. Yeah, so. Ralph, I'll, I'll be happy to go in in there and and add in all the all the strategies and the recommendations that had consensus. I think that will be very helpful and might be able to you know add to the perimeters, the resilience perimeters. Right. Well, I appreciate it. And um, and, and let me just ask: we're uh, we're about we have about 18 minutes left. You know, are there others that uh, would like to weigh in based on what they've heard? We we have time to do that. Raising your hand, uh, John will see it, or just uh, speaking up, or you know, we'll we'll give it another minute or two, and if not, we'll we'll end here. So I'm just kind of looking through. Uh, we do have like two slides at the end with some information, though. Um, right. Two. We, we so. do, oh yeah. By the way, we have two uh, hands up. Or Marianne. Uh, Marianne. Woodard. Yeah. Um, Marianne Woodard, I put a question in the chat that maybe you can see about reaching out to homeowner associations, for example, in the middle Rio Grande, because, it, well, I've, I've set it out in the chat, if you can see that question. Um, it, is that something you can see? I, yeah, I, I, I type back to that, Marianne. Um, I was saying, you know, today was mainly focusing on the, the agricultural use, and that um, kind of would be yes. um, something to bring up, especially on, on Wednesday when we talk about public water systems and also quality of life. You know, when we, recreation quality of life was something that we were trying to capture the, the concept of, you know, an individual that maybe doesn't understand how a utility works or something like that, you know, but they, on on their own quality of life, you know, their day to day living, how can they look at resiliency in that piece? So, but that no, that's a great input on that. Um, I did um, want to say thanks for that input, and 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 that is something to to think about with you know the public water systems on on Wednesday and Thursday this week. Well, and part of it is some of these were so recently until very recently ag in agriculture. And being rapidly now converted to suburban housing, so I mix the two. I apologize. <laughs> no, hey, and John, I don't think the rest of us saw that chat. Is it, are there any more that we should be aware of as a group? They might have um, gone to you only. Oh, uh, it's just in the questions area, Ralph. Um, um. There. Um, uh, okay, I don't. 
I'm trying to see if everybody else sees that. Oh, okay, I see it now. Yep. So. Well, but thank you for that. I guess yeah, that's kind yeah. of an interesting pull down. Um, yeah, John, if uh, if if there is, yep. are there I can jump to them or? again. Uh, um, um, well, there, is one, there is a question. There's a question on, on Wednesday's talk. Uh, it, domestic wells mean those owned by individuals. Yeah. Yes, it, that individual self supplied uh, domestic wells also. So um, that will be uh, Wednesday's. And then again on Thursday will be an in depth look of that, um, of that, uh, the parameters and stuff. So let me um, go on again. We, we do have an online survey. Um, this, um, until I wasn't able to, um, I apologize, it, I, it is not up on our website currently. Uh, so the, the um, but it will be up there as soon as possible. But the survey link is available on this. Uh, I will have this uh, whole, uh, presentation on PDF form in the in case you missed it tab uh, where all the webinars are and and also um, that will the link will be on this slide that you can select and jump to the survey it also is in the chat right now um, so feel free to get on there and 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 take that and we the more input the better for us uh, again um, if you have comments uh, uh, also, um, I guess I should go to the next side. For our website, again, if, for further information on the 50-year water plan, go to our website on the 50-year water plan. Again, if you have comments or questions, uh, we have comment pages. Also, the again, the leap ahead analysis is available for, for public review. Uh, it would be great um, that the link is in multiple spots on our website. Um, and um, also, if you haven't been getting any emails from us about these events, shoot an email to to our email to to, to get up, put on there into the future for newsletters. Again, tomorrow afternoon, we're gonna at two o'clock. Uh, Amy Lewis um, uh, is gonna be doing an in-depth look at the agricultural um, and livestock watering. Um, uh, uh, a resilience assessment piece that we talked about today. So um, tomorrow we'll be we'll dive a little deeper in depth on those parameters. And so feel free to attend that. And, and again, more input the better, um, uh, so we can um, set these up to be you know to come out great. Um, if you have any um, again, once the the link will be available for the survey on our website, it should be just on the main page of the 50-year water plan and also there's a tab that says public input it will also be located there so just in case you're looking around that website it can get it's easy to get lost in it and i i admit it <laughs> so um but if you have any questions feel free um jump on there if you have comments on again the leap ahead or questions um there is a public input piece for that too um with that ralph do you have any final things just just one um and that is you know the we're talking today about just the agricultural water use sector but i think we're all aware that you know these sectors are not really that clean as individual sectors when they're on the ground um you know, I know in parts of northern New Mexico, um, you know, water supply issues associated with the sequias and community ditches gets tied in and is somewhat uh, interrelated at times with uh, mutual domestics uh, yeah, re relative to clean potable water. Um, you know, the operation of those sequias and the recharge from them um, is sometimes a source parameter for those public supply systems. In the Middle Valley, um, you know, uh, the, the aspect of uh, the tie-ins between irrigated agriculture, the, um, the, the 
refuge systems that exist in the middle Rio Grande and the river as uh, Mike described relative to uh, endangered species issues or riverine health are there. Um, you know, some of that, some of those issues could either be taken up in public water supply. Some of them might be in the, you know, habitat, watershed, forest pieces of it. Um, you know, uh, but we realize they're not, you know, these are linked uses, just not exactly sure if there's a way to recognize, you know, these linked uses is when we look at any one individual matrix. So if you have some thoughts in that regard, um, you know, we very much appreciate it. And that's all I have. Thank you all for uh, your attendance and um, hope, look forward to, uh, to seeing the input received. Yes, thanks for attending and we'll see you tomorrow for the in-depth uh, uh, webinar with Amy Lewis at 2 p.m. I hope everybody attends. See you all then. Take care.